Two, two questions that are both... Two questions? Okay, fine. See, deflation already. Thank you. Uh, but both of them are risks against Bitcoin. The first one is technological. Uh, recently, NIST, instead of starting promoting migration from SHA-2 to SHA-3, said it is time to start thinking about migrating to post-quantum cryptography, the one that is going to weaken... Um, Sorry, the, the, the post-quantum cryptography that is going to weaken uh, asymmetric cryptography yes. and Shadow. And um, so we are talking about the attack of 51%, but in that case, it will be in 10 or 20 years, attack of 99%. Because one guy, one bad actor with a quantum uh, computer is going to be uh, spending much less energy and much less electricity than anyone else and having 99% of the uh, hashing capability. So but if it's 99%, it's not an attack. You realize that? Yeah. He is monopoly. And um, well, he, not he, he owns okay. the, the Bitcoin. And, well, and, and, so we, uh, uh, and so, j j very quickly. That's so, the so first question. Okay. Yes, so we change the, the algorithm, we put a proof of stake, uh, things like that. And second question is also the corporations and the governments that you started with. They are not going to be happy with Bitcoin. They oh, are not no. Happy. So... Bitcoin will have to respond. W the community will have to. Any ideas about this, please? Okay, great. First question. Um, so quantum cryptography and um, more, more specifically quantum cryptanalysis will allow at some point quantum computing to exceed the abilities of current cryptographic algorithms. Listen, that's part of being in cryptography. Cryptography, you're looking at 20 to 30 years of usable life cycle for uh, an algorithm before it gets exceeded by current technology, uh, new developments in mathematics, etc. etc. Um, I think the system within Bitcoin is such that it can be upgraded. Both the uh, signing algorithm and the hashing algorithm can be switched out for other algorithms, if we think that it, there is a need to do that. So quantum cryptography represents a threat only if it is unevenly distributed in commercial sectors. Right? Um, if quantum cryptography is available only to one actor, and not all the actors, most likely, if quantum cryptography or quantum cryptanalysis and quantum computing is available only to one actor, that actor is a state actor. That actor is going to not use it for Bitcoin. What they're going to do is keep it secret and use it for the time when they're threatened by a cryptographically secured nuclear weapon or whatever. Some crazy idea like that. Uh, certainly, what we've seen with intelligence agencies that have computing advantages, they don't use it until there is a dire emergency to use it, and Bitcoin isn't the dire emergency. Because once you use it and everybody knows you have it, then all of the algorithms get changed and you have one shot. Right? So better make it good. If quantum computing is available broadly, then all the miners upgrade to quantum computers, and we do shantum, sh shantum qua, quantum sha, <laughs> qua shantum, sha quantum, something like that. I, I don't know. Uh, we're probably going to change the algorithm. Um, if there is enough availability of quantum computing, that 99% of the mining capacity switches over. Uh, the chance that that's going to be controlled by one person is pretty slim. In fact, what you're going to end up doing is just switching everybody to running SHA on quantum computers, and then it's just the same as when we went from FPGA to ASIC. Um, we're going to be looking at a different order of magnitude or several orders of magnitude in improvement. But keep in mind, running a quantum computer is neither free uh, nor easy, right? Um, it's going to be expensive in terms of energy and cooling costs, etc. And the electricity that you're not spending doing SHA, you're spending keeping the thing at you know 200 degrees uh, below zero. So um, all of these things add up. We don't know what the economics will be. I try not to solve problems until problems are up, and I think Bitcoin is very much a system where we solve problems when it's necessary to solve problems. So we'll see. Um, as for the second thing, corporations and governments are not going to be happy. Sure they're not. I'm sure they won't be happy. Um, I believe this is the place where, at some point, the people decided that the king wouldn't be happy too much with their choices. And kings were not happy anywhere. And yet the revolution happened anyway. Bitcoin is a technological revolution, and it's a global system. The bottom line is that corporations and governments adapt, 
and they adapt to new technologies, and they have been adapting to new technologies for hundreds of years, sometimes thousands of years, and they're going to adapt to Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin is neither the worst thing that's ever happened in technology, nor the most insurmountable thing that's ever happened in technology. And there could be far worse cryptocurrencies than Bitcoin, uh, from the perspective of government. Um, the fact that governments are not going to be happy really doesn't concern me much, because Bitcoin is a system that does not require their permission, their approval, or their cooperation, or their endorsement, or their assistance. It is a system that simply exists. And we can deny that fact, but it still exists. We can pretend it's going away, but it isn't. And we can talk all day about whether governments should or shouldn't regulate Bitcoin. But the really difficult question is whether governments can regulate Bitcoin. And the answer is simple. They can't. They can't regulate Bitcoin itself. They can regulate at the edge. They can regulate the behavior of some of the users of Bitcoin if they're within their borders and under certain circumstances. But the truth is that they can't really regulate Bitcoin itself. Um, so governments and corporations are going to have to adapt, and I think that's one of the features of Bitcoin, not one of its bugs. I think that's one of the reasons why Bitcoin is so exciting to a lot of people, is because it introduces a new choice. It's not saying you can't do the old way. It's not saying you can't do hierarchical corporation and organization. You can't do uh, restricted within one border jurisdiction payment systems. You can't do banking with a central bank. You can do all of those things. But we're going to also do this. And we'll see which one is better. And, and that's really the, the bottom line.